Okay, welcome back. So welcome back to part three of our Uncharted 4 Environment Art event. Uh, thank you for staying with us, both, both here in the stage and also online. Um, if you missed parts one and two online, uh, you can find them archived on our live stream channel at livestream.com forward slash nomen, so be sure to check those out. Um, so before the break, we heard from Anthony, Heather, and David about their Madagascar and the fancy ship production work. Um, so part three, we now have Todd and John to talk us through more of the production work on Uncharted 4, um, while also touching on how they support gameplay through readability. And I think I accidentally called you Josh earlier, so I oh, do apologize for that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, round of applause, and we'll get started with part three. Hi, uh, my name's Todd Foster. I'm one of the environment modelers. And this is John. Uh, John Schmidt. I'm a texture shader artist. Uh, our HR uh, department tweeted us and wanted to, want us to mention that we are currently hiring for, uh, I think, multiple texture artist positions. And I'm sure there's also a ton of other jobs listed up on the website because we're ramping up as everybody in the room probably already knows we have a bunch of stuff in production. So Couple projects. We are looking for people, but especially environment texture artists, please. Um, the other thing I wanted to explain a little bit was I think a couple of people tonight mentioned or we might have heard us say mentioned foreground artists versus background, basically environment guys. We call them background artists at Naughty Dog. That's environment texture artists and modelers together. Uh, foreground artists is a separate department and usually what they work on are things like um, weaponry or vehicles, but then they also deal a lot with the environment guys on destruction or rigging of objects that need animation or simulation, you know, havoc properties and that kind of thing. So a lot of times what will happen is we'll build the environment out and like for example uh, David Ship, the fancy, and then he will hand off the chunks or maybe the whole thing over to the foreground guys and they'll figure out whatever crazy system they need to devise in order to get it to animate correctly or be, you know, to be destroyed, catch on fire, all that kind of stuff. So if there's any confusion about what our roles were, that's, that's a deal with foreground. Uh, yes, so I'm gonna be talking about being the player's guide in Uncharted 4. Uh, so as far as environment modelers, which is what I, is what I do, um, there's three main things that we're dealing with. And by the way, for the levels that I worked on, I worked mostly with a, an artist named Adam Marquis. He was my texture artist. Uh, but in my presentation here, I'm kind of showing a broad array of the game because some of the other areas that I didn't work on demonstrated some of the techniques that we use uh, kind of related to what I'm going to show you. So, you know, number one, we're, we want a, a world that looks great. And everybody tonight showed a bunch of examples of that. Don't really need to focus too much on that. Secondly, we need a level that performs great, which means optimizations, making sure it's fitting in memory, making sure that it's in frame rate, the LODs, all that sort of stuff, shader complexity, making sure everything's optimized. And then thirdly, which most, is most important of all, which I think as artists, sometimes, especially when you're coming through school, you may not be thinking about, is that it's a video game. The most important thing, it's got to play great. So what does that mean? A bunch of stuff goes into that. For example, you have to build collisions for everything in the entire world so that the player can bump up to it, interact with it, and make sure that it is, you know, looks correct, looks realistic. Uh, player cover, if, if Drake's in combat, he's got to be able to go up to every crate in the game, take cover, and be able to aim correctly over the top of it. So that requires work. There's other stuff, blah, blah, blah. There's edge grabs that have to be worked on. <laughs> Drake has to be able to grab every little thing. If he goes up to his table, he's got to be able to vault over it correctly. It's got to be the correct width, blah, blah, blah. There's more gameplay stuff. There's a ton of it. But one of the things we really want to focus on is making sure that the player knows where to go next because they can get frustrated very easily. We play test the game starting pretty early in production and probably the most consistent thing that players run up against is losing their way. They don't know what to do next. It happens in every video game in the world and it, it can kill your game. If they get frustrated, they're gonna put the game down, they're gonna return it to GameStop, they're not gonna buy your next game, they're just gonna hate it, they're gonna tell their friends, they're gonna tweet about it, they're gonna go on NeoGAF, they're gonna flame you, they're gonna try to add you on Facebook and friend you and you'll be like, who's this guy? So you wanna make sure it plays well, they know where they're going. So that's mostly what I wanna talk Sorry about. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's all right. Because being lost sucks. 
see how sad he is there? He's like, he's on an island, he doesn't know how to get off it, he has no clue. <laughs> so, starting big picture, and this is kind of related, it starts really with the game design when we block out the level. I don't really have any screenshots of the, this particular block out, but we want to show the player's goal. In a lot of cases, especially in Uncharted 4, um, this carried over a long period of gameplay. So, for, this is our PSX demo. Drake just woke up in a cave, and he kind of like wakes up, looks around, which is part of the video we showed earlier, and I feel like it's a spoiler, but Sam, his brother, is off in the distance somewhere, and he sees a little flashing light, and it's on this, this mountain, right, here. And that's, uh, we called it Turtle Rock. I don't know if we ever really named it that mm -hmm. in the game, but mm -hmm. internally we call it Turtle Rock because it looks like a big turtle's head. Snap the turtle. And the idea was that no matter, as the player is making his way across the island, we always wanted to show Turtle Rock, and you're going to progress through the game, you're going to see it and get closer and closer. And so here we go. After Drake leaves the cave, he kind of wanders for a while. He goes inside of some, or I'm sorry, uh, the, his first cave, he wanders for a while along the shore, goes into some smaller caves. You kind of lose sight of Turtle Rock. You don't really know exactly where you are, if you're making progress or not. You climb up this one cliff face, and you get another shot, and here we kind of like reestablish its position. And this, having this large, it's called a weenie, by the way, um, having a weenie in the game like this, it gives the player a sense of orientation. So even if they're in a, you know, like that becomes their true north, basically. They know they're working towards something. So later on in the game, I think this was Andres's level, mm -hmm. you can see Drake barely there. He's on top. When he climbs to the top of this tower, we give a great uh, shot of the vista, camera sweeps around and there's Turtle Rock again and then Drake knows, okay, I'm getting closer and closer to this mountain. Until finally, he's literally underneath it and, spoilers, eventually goes inside and there's Dave's ship. Here's another example, this was from our E3 demo that yes, I also worked on. <laughs> and this was the tower, the Jeep was going very quickly so we had to make sure that his goal was very obvious, and we tried to keep it centered and kind of in the middle of the screen all the time because as the player is cruising around, it's easy to kind of get turned around and, and get lost and be off track. So we, there goes Rick and Sully. And that's the first step. The second thing you want to keep, on, uh, keep in mind is to define spaces. So when we get a block out for a level, for example, this is a Colony, it's a bunch of nondescript boxes. It'll be a bunch of uh, you know, buildings. You know that in some cases you don't even know necessarily it's a building, but it forms some sort of, sort of function in the game space. And so what you have to do is kind of break out each area and determine what is going on. And in the case of Colony, I don't know if we have anyone who worked on it, but there was a ton of these uh, areas that Drake can go in and out of. So it's great to take each space and be like, okay, this here is a blacksmith shop. Let's build it out so the player understands what it is. He can look at it and be like, okay, it's a blacksmith, blacksmith shop. And of course that makes the world more believable, but it also helps guide the player because if he turns around and goes out the door and goes into another building and comes back, he may be like, was I in this same nondescript building before? But if he sees, oh no, okay, I'm in the blacksmith shop, he knows where he is, he kind of remembers what's going on. This one's in Gala, it's a little gardener's shed. It was kind of outside. Uh, in one of the fields, it's multiple floors, player can recognize, okay, I'm upstairs in the garden shed or, you know, I'm downstairs in like the cellar area. Um, and number three, you want to create landmarks. And this is kind of similar to defining an area. In this case, this is one of my levels, it's Scotland. And it's kind of, a lot of the caves through Scotland, it's this massive like 25 or 30 minute long gameplay stretch where it's all basalt caves and how do you make them look unique so that the player doesn't feel like he's you know, going through the same monotonous area time and time again. And in cases like this, you may play through the same space multiple times coming in from different directions and you don't even realize necessarily where you are unless you have a, a landmark, which uh, in this case, it's this archway with these statues that serve that purpose. It's a man-made structure within the cave so the player is more likely to notice it and take note of it, and that becomes their mental bookmark for that area so that if he comes back in, he's like, oh, I'm back at the statues. I, I made my way to this archway, which, is, which I've kind of been heading towards for a while. I can finally get through it. 
This is from our E3 demo, it's the same sort of thing. In this case, it's, you know, it's a literal landmark. Um, in the middle of the square, the Jeep comes in from one direction of the square, careens down an alleyway, loses sight of the square itself, and eventually comes back in. And when, he, when the player comes back in, we make sure that he's facing towards this landmark so he can reorient himself and hopefully remembers, oh, okay, I can go across the square and I'll probably be able to advance. And so everything up to this point has been about creating awareness of space for the, within the player. They know where they are, what their goal is, but that's not enough. Uh, with, within any particular space, how do we guide the player? And that's because on a, on a micro level, when you step into a room, how do we make sure that they are looking at the exact spot we want them to look at? Not just are they looking at the giant mountain or the monument, but are they looking at the small little detail that we want to make sure they don't notice? And we do that with magic. <laughs> So number four, shapes and composition. Here's sort of a, one of our puzzles that's within the Scotland Caves. And we want to make sure, it's pretty obvious you're going to go up to the giant machine and use it, but still we want to draw the player in, make sure they feel like it's welcome and they know exactly this is the goal. So, and this kind of goes for any environment. Um, we do this all the time. We use composition to lead the eye, you know, and one of, the case, one of the things we do is a lot of arched shapes, and it might be in the jungle, you might have like, uh, you know, branches going up overhead and bushes, or it might be architecture, or it might be a literal arch like in the square in the E3 demo, you drive through the arch because we want to make sure the player is looking through the arch and sees the landmark and then continues on, so it's all very readable. We frame it on both sides and draws the player in. Again, man-made shapes stand out within an, orga within an organic uh, environment and vice versa, so that you know, if, if something is made uh, by man, it's gonna have very sort of uh, geometric shapes and it'll stand out. Flat surfaces on the ground, people kind of just understand them as a pathway and it doesn't even have to be stone tiles, like in this case, like this, these basalt um, floor pieces. It can be debris, it can be anything that kind of forms a pattern that the eye picks up on and the player will sort of naturally be, be drawn along it. Here's another stairway. We have an arch. It's a man-made structure. We use the fog in the environment to like separate the arch from the, the area behind it, which gives it a good read. The path that the player is gonna walk on, we try to separate the floors from the walls and we do this in pretty much every environment. You want the path to be fairly uh, free of debris, it doesn't look too cluttered, maybe has a little bit of detail here and there, but it looks like something that's sort of drawing you in and you kind of frame the edges of it with snow and debris and push everything to the outside and that gives a really clear defined path. And then number five, we use color and visual language kind of related to each other. In this case, uh, Scotland in the exterior you have these tarps, these bright blue tarps covering what are cover objects before the player drops down into a, what's going to be a combat space. So he looks down, he sees these things, it's obvious, it stands out from the uh, kind of like neutral colors of the environment, and as soon as they drop down, they're gonna get shot, they're gonna have to know where to go, they're gonna immediately go for the cover objects. And here's a little bit more complex situation where it's kind of difficult for the player to know where he's got to go because he's go, we want him to go through this window that's off in the distance, but it's not necessarily super inviting, so we try to really be a little more heavy-handed. In this case, a uh, texture artist puts scratches on the ground and then across the wall that's to the right that we want them to kind of hop out onto. We break away the railing, and then we have we clear the path of the, for the player visually along the walls, hoping that they will notice the ledge grabs and then the brightly colored window with a missing pane in the distance. And then uh, once again, we, this is sort of standard gameplay stuff, but we separate the color of the floor from the walls so the player can easily read, okay, here's a floor, here's a wall, there's a window, I think I can get through that window. And of course we use edge grabs, or I'm sorry, edge highlighting on top of all the surfaces that Drake can grab. It's a shader trick or technique uh, that we blend usually with vertex colors so you can, the player can easily see which surfaces are grabbable. 
And then, if we really need to be heavy-handed, we throw in an animated object that's bright red and put it behind a glowing white background. And then they'll hopefully notice it and walk through the or climb over the window. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that was motion, and then number seven is lighting, which is, um, we don't have any lighting artists here today, but that's critical too for readability and environment and leading a player through it. In this case, this was also from the PSX demo, uh, we kind of committed a design sin by placing <laughs> an object above the player's head, and we, we wanted to make sure they saw it. It was important that the thing be high in the air, because in this case, Drake's about to get his piton, which he uses for climbing. The piton's attached to the rope that this uh, dead pirate is hanging from. So the, pi the player has to look up and notice the skeleton and then realize, okay, that's our goal. I'm gonna climb up this wall. So in this case, we hit the skeleton with a dynamic light, with a runtime light. Uh, we animated it. Right? That helps the player see it. We then cleared off the wall where the shadow from the runtime is being hit so that the shadow was huge and animated also because the guy is animated so that hopefully the player will at least notice a shadow and look up a little higher and then see the guy. The, the environment itself was completely rearranged on the right-hand side to allow the sun to come in at the right angle to hit the area and kind of brighten it a bit. And then the textures of the skeleton were changed to separate it from the background. We made sure that the shadows from the rock above the skeleton were casting on the environment just below to make it darker so that he then popped out and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And here you go. The climb itself reads pretty well. Uh, it's got its edge grab highlighting. And then up above where the piton attaches, we start to establish the visual language for the piton climbable material, which is sort of this spongy looking rock that we're gonna carry out throughout the game. So anytime you see a rock that's like that, um, you know that it's, you can use your piton on it, stick it in there and climb along. And so to put it all together, this is from the prison escape scene um, with Sam. And at the beginning of this, of this particular stretch, uh, the player is, are running along really quickly, we had to make sure that all the reads to the player are communicated uh, effectively because they don't really have a lot of time to make decisions. So it has to be really heavy handed and obvious. Usually we try to be a little more subtle because it's sort of this uh, balance between aesthetic and um, design. And, but in situations like this, we have to be a little bit over the top. So we start off with a goal, which is a tower. It's dead center. It's kind of framed like goal posts in the environment. We have barbed wire going across the fence that you can't go over in front of you, but we have edge highlighting on the railing so the player knows, hey, I can probably hop over this railing, but probably not over that barbed wire, so I'm gonna drop down and see what happens. He does so, runs along some alleys for a while, climbs back up, we reestablish the tower in the background on the right, barbed wire is in front of him on the, on the right-hand side, can't go that way, so we're gonna turn to the left and we use composition to funnel the player's vision in to say, okay, this is probably gonna be a safe jump because just based by looking at it and we're gonna have some edge grabs in front of the player, hopefully they'll think I can make this jump and grab something. And they do, and they climb up. <laughs> they swing along the side of this tower and there's some pipes that are just a visual flare, but they're really there to lead the eye because the pipes go vertically up the side and then bend back in towards the open door frame, which is dark, it's not lit particularly well, but the eye is gonna, this should do enough to allow the player to realize, okay, there's an opening up there, I can get through there. And at the same time, we can see the tower on the right-hand side kind of keeping that ultimate goal in view. And, wait, that's it, one more? Nope, that's it. Hey. So, yeah, that's what we, that's how we kind of, yeah. So this is uh, super surreal. Uh, 
echoing what uh, Jeremy said. Um, I've been making games for 13 years, also. Um, been a fan of Naughty Dog since uh, Crash Bandicoot. Um, but Uncharted 2 was the, the it game. It was the, holy, wow, yeah, they, they did something special there. Um, but I didn't say, that's going to be my next job. Didn't think it was ever going to happen, so um, it did. Um, so let's see, I joined uh, onto Uncharted 4 after working on the DLC with uh, Brian and Ruben uh, and my modeling counterpart, uh, Jose Vega. Um, so we joined later on in the production where there were a lot of um, assets already made. People have commented on that before. Tons of sharing. Um, and it was crazy going from this very real, very strict uh, Last of Us world um, to making pirates. Um, these awesome pirate carving sigils. Um, underground ruins going from this neon arcade um, with Ellie to the, the Uncharted Ruins was quite the change and uh, really cool and exciting. Um, we did the uh, Madagas Madagascar Volcano area, uh, the St. Demas uh, sculpture, that uh, huge battle scene. Um, this level in particular went through, I believe, three separate um, gameplay iterations, so we had to make it pretty unfunctional when you first find it, um, and then there's a huge explosion. Uh, the dome comes caving in, makes all these crazy shapes that we had to make uh, functional and believable uh, when they hit the ground. Um, and that was a huge challenge uh, and tons of um, coordination with design and foreground. Um, we actually had a new light map uh, technology that we came up with, animated light maps. Uh, so we had this dome in place that was like vertlet and then it would fall and hit the ground and it was vertlet. And it just didn't, it didn't feel grounded at all. It wasn't, wasn't hitting the, the quality bar we wanted. Um, so we had this animated light map where we could actually bake it in its initial position up at the top of the dome, and then when the pieces fell, it actually lurked to a different light map and then cooked it on the ground too, um, which allowed it to feel like it actually fell and hit the ground there. Um, it was a pretty smooth transition. Hopefully nobody noticed that it was doing something a little weird in the lighting. Uh, explosions helped to distract, for sure. Um, in this ruin section, um, talking about, uh, Dave was mentioning how um, he was thinking organically, how did that grass, grass get there? Um, so Jose and I had not the luxury of the amazing grasses that the rest of Madagascar had, because we were underground in this tunnel with no light, no access to plant seeds to, to grow grass. So when we got these, uh, these little sections here where we could put grass where light would hit it, so that grass could therefore grow. Um, so in our mind, we had the, the swirl of the wind would be coming in, and actually, um, ZBrush modeled the, the swirling dunes um, in there and actually thought about, okay, if the wind curved through the broken hole in the dome over hundreds of years and swirled around the inside of this dome, this is kind of the twirl that the uh, sand dunes would have and it would gather up more here and be cleared out more here because it would get more of a gust where the, where the uh, grass was and then it would be building up along the walls and whatnot. Um, and then some grass seed could have stuck there and, and uh, grown from the sunlight. Um, and then there were a lot of carvings on the ground, these intricate um, carvings that got mostly covered in uh, sand. And there's this uh, uh, shot right before the, uh, the roof collapses. Um, hey, I worked on the E3 demo. Uh, <laughs> uh, which was super awesome. I go from this crazy ruins under the ground and then Jose and I get pulled out to these Madagascar docks. Uh, we got to work on the amazing chase sequence at the end. Um, we super had the easy job compared to everyone else. Everybody else's memory had been dumped behind us and we were like, hey, we have all the memory in the world now. Um, and we just got to essentially make a Hollywood set. So we got to think what's, what's the coolest things, the f most fun details that we can put out there. Um, and then just have this, put as much destructible stuff in front of the truck as possible and work with our uh, designer, Anthony. Um, to make it functional and fun and exciting and just have crap just get knocked over all the time uh, in front of you. Um, and as a, a game dev um, trophy unlocked, I got to make a metal barrel for a game. I was like, yes, I finally got to do it. I made the metal barrel for Uncharted. It's crazy. Um, life goals. Life goals. Uh, and another shot of the docks with all the uh, explosions. We got to make a ton of giant cranes. Um, talk about research. Um, I have a friend. 
uh, Kai who actually works at the San Diego, San Diego um, Pier. And uh, he, I would go on his Facebook page and grab some of his photos when he'd be like at work in his forklifts and he'd take all these awesome photos and I was like, oh, that's perfect reference, thank you. Um, and put it, into, put it into use here. Um, and the final hurrah in the sunset. And then we go from these crazy rusty metal docks to ancient ships um, that have been miraculously preserved and there's rocky shores sheltered by a cove. Um, so it's mildly believable that they're still sitting there. Uh, but then we got to make pirate ships and palm trees, place palm trees made by the incredible Full Age team. Um, and as uh, Heather and Dave mentioned, um, we made 13 completely unique destructed versions of the ships that uh, Anthony and David and Heather uh, worked on. Um, every single one of them was completely unique because they're very specific for gameplay cover, traversal, um, and I even went so far as to be inspired by all of the uh, amazing um, portraits painted of the pirates. Um, they had color schemes. Um, so one of the dudes had uh, white and blue, so I painted this, the ship had like a blue accent color and mostly painted white. Um, another guy, the one in the middle, is red and black. Uh, there's a later one on this more fine boy, it's like purple um, and, and oranges. And um, it was just cool getting to play with, uh, with that extra bit of, of palette and also just um, to try to break up the world, like Anthony said, try to make the player feel like you're in somewhere else. For the longest time in the development, it was all just brown ships. Um, and it was very like, blah, same, same old, same old. But then eventually, you got the color in there, and then you felt, okay, I'm now on a different pirate ship. Um, different pirate captain had his own, his or her own flair uh, that they put on their ship. Um, and then so the ship where you ultimately climb, well, you were going to climb out, actually, um, but you end up shimmying your way out of there. But we had this giant spotlight coming through there um, to draw the player to the back of the ship. Um, and this was fun. This was actually the flipped over ship, so the ground is actually the ceiling. Um, and you climb out of the bowels of the ship that way. Um, and making an upside down ship playable was a, a ton of fun. Um, oh, and then I wanted to go back um, and mention that we had 13 unique ships, and then also they animated and blew up uh, as well. And uh, we did the um, sinking ship section where the ship blows up and you slide down and then you fall underwater. And we're like, okay, cool, we made it through like the falling mass and we made it through the sinking, uh, the ship that falls into the water and sinks down. We're like, okay, we're good. And then design's like, we got one more. When you're swimming underwater, that one's gonna move too and then you have to get out before you drown. So it just kept happening, it was, uh, it was fun. Um, so during the time, downtime that I had, well, not really downtime, but uh, between projects, the DLC um, for The Last of Us uh, left behind, and then moving on to Uncharted 4. In the interim, I got uh, to get familiar with Substance Designer, um, or just uh, Bradford Smith, I've been working very closely with uh, Alec Rhythmic, um, just exploring this exciting new technology. Um, and I knew that I would have a ton of tiles and a ton of brick walls and a ton of um, unique pirate carvings um, throughout the world to make. So I wanted to try to see if I could harness the power of this technology um, and create and iterate on designs as fast as possible. Um, so these are sort of the, the, the labors uh, or the results of the labor um, of coming up with this, this thing that I dubbed the stone carver node. Um, I'll try to not get too technical on this, on this talk and kind of keep it a little bit um, looser. Um, but basically what this node did is I could draw like a simple, um, hopefully the pointer's showing up there? Yes, okay. Um, a black and white drawing, and all I had to do is draw this pattern out, and then I could put in different values of, of where I wanted different colors to appear, and then I'd plug it into the, the stone carver node, and it would trash it, make it old and rustic and beat up and worn and chipped and cracked. Um, just automatically. And if I didn't like the first go on it, I could hit the random seed button and get a different variation. Um, so these are a couple of the different um, patterns and textures uh, that were all produced um, with simple um, black and white lines, um, no sculpting. This is all just procedural substance. Um, and then this herringbone uh, was actually created using uh, Rogelio's um, awesome uh, 
tool that he made. He made a node that creates that crazy pattern. Um, and a couple more tiles, bricks. This is the gorgeous Metroid level um, world map, <laughs> Castlevania, um, Shadow Complex, whatever you want to call it. Um, this is the giant node. So I'm going to go through kind of quickly and break down sort of how this was assembled. Um, I had posted some stuff on uh, that new Fangold art station, and uh, some people were super interested in, in how this thing um, came together, what the, was the, the thoughts going into it. Um, so I, again, I want to give a huge, huge shout out to uh, Bradford Smith um, for his amazing uh, knowledge and his incredible secret nodes uh, that I get to play with um, uh, here at Naughty Dog. Um, so basically the first thing, I, as I mentioned, um, we got our input pattern and you just plug your black and white texture into there, simple line drawing, and it, and it takes it from there. Um, so it basically works like this. You drop in the two nodes. I made a little buddy node for the stone carver um, called the input generator, and it creates basically all of the maps that you would need to create um, a ton of variety in your, um, your tile uh, material. Um, it has a, um, so I'll go to the next slide. It has a pattern, um, which is using a tile generator in substance, uh, a slightly modified one that Brad did. Um, and you could set up whatever pile, pattern that you want from there, um, and then it outputs five maps, the base uh, line to make the carving, um, the pattern colors to break it up if I wanted certain sections painted or not painted, um, and then a pattern height variation, um, which is basically pushing and pulling tiles like we would do in ZBrush. We'd actually physically be grabbing the uh, mesh and pulling it and pushing it to, to give cool variation to it. Um, and that just does it with a height path. Um, and then the pattern slope variation, like it's always fun to take and tilt and rotate tiles. Um, so this kind of does it fake, um, just gives little slopes on some of them. Uh, and then the final one was a uh, custom crack uh, mask. So those um, white tiles there would be the only ones that actually receive cracks. Because if you leave it, giant cracks just going through the entire surface, they give a crack that's just going over every single surface. It feels kind of unrealistic. Um, so this mask over there will just isolate cracks where this one kind of stops here and doesn't unnaturally travel through every single one of these tiles. So with this node, um, the tile generator is actually five tile generators inside of the uh, input generator. Um, that allows me to change the scale, size, number of uh, tiles at any point. Um, and on the fly, just totally redo um, the entire setup for, for how many tiles are there. Like, oh no, I think nine by nine would look better, or five by four, or, um, and it handles all those variations. Um, so the, the basic chiseling, um, how that's accomplished in here is just a bunch of um, just very simple steps. Um, a lot of blur nodes, I love the slope blur. Um, the non-uniform blur is also great, just to add some extra nuances and smears to these rigid line drawings. If you put them in there just like that, it'll feel a little bit fake. Um, but if you blur it and slope it, blur it, and uh, add a non-uniform blur, it's, it smears it and creates more interesting um, warbles and whatnot that we used to go in there and hand paint all the edges, but now this thing will just do it automatically. Um, and then there's some secret sauce in the, in the end. Uh, there's a form builder node that basically allows higher frequency details to merge or lay nicely on top of larger frequency forms. Um, and the depth slicer, which is one of, these are both Brad Smith nodes, um, the depth slicer uh, just kind of adds some cool like layered rock texture to uh, the surfaces. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of glaze over some of this stuff. Uh, every section of this pretty much has a custom slot, so if you don't like the cracks that I have by default, you can plug in your own unique generator into that node and crack your surface. Uh, this is showing the, the masking of the cracks. Um, you can see how it looks a little bit weird when there's cracks over the entire surface, but if you can stop them on certain tiles, um, that helps it feel a little bit more natural. Um, I wanted to thank Richard Piper uh, for that recommendation. Uh, he took to the node pretty early and gave a bunch of awesome feedback um, and helped it uh, come along. Uh, let's see. Um, 
in this section of the node, um, it's the color mask section, it takes um, those maps and basically masks out all of the cracks because if, if a piece of stone was painted and then it got cracked, uh, the crack underneath wouldn't be red painted, it would be you know, the natural stone beneath. Um, so this section kind of just masks out um, all those different uh, cracks, uh, wear and tear, pits, um, and uh, the grout as well. Um, so this just shows how you could turn on different accent colors using the procedurally generated um, color masks um, and how it'll keep that as you change uh, your different variety of scale, your different number of tiles, your different um, proportions of tiles. You got itty bitty tiles, you got big ones. Um, and they all, yeah, it, it just keeps making fun stuff for you. Um, let's see. This one is a cool one. This one you can take uh, like the default stone. It's meant to look like very old worn stone like I um, worked with mostly in Madagascar. Um, but you can also take that and swap it out for like a smooth granite and now instead of having like uh, these old weathered rustic stones, now you can put in uh, this smooth marble across the stones or you could do uh, clay tiles or some sort of different surface material to it. Um, and by default it's using another one of Brad Smith's amazing uh, rough layered surface node, he called it. Uh, it was just a really cool rock feel. Um, <clears throat> there's a chip generator um, that basically just uses a bunch of noises and blurs um, and spots and um, tiling height controls and then slope blur. Um, and then it just kind of smashes all that together and then it puts, outputs a mask as well that it uses to remove the, the accent colors and whatnot from it. Uh, let's see, the um, tile random, uh, this is a, the crack generator. Um, it uses a basic tile random uh, node uh, that has a disk shape. Um, and then it kind of takes that and it smears it out and then it uses a Perlin noise to uh, disturb it um, and, and make it feel a little bit more organic. Um, and then another slope blur and you know, I like the slope blur. Um, and then there's another layer of uh, just Crunch maps, just standard substance scrub map, crunch maps that I really like. Um, and just put those in there and then those blend in, just kind of scuff up the surface and you can remove those if you want. If you want like non-weathered ones, if you want super weathered, weathered ones, you slide it up and add more wear and tear to it. Um, this is just showing um, the height or the, uh, the mask that can be created for the height variation and then it being laid over the uh, generated height map here. Um, same thing for the pattern slope. You can kind of see a little bit of a highlight here and a little bit of a darker edge there, kind of giving it a little bit of a slant to the tile. Um, let's see, there's something I came up with, uh, added on there called advanced grout. So instead of just having plain Jane, um, smooth uh, grout in the middle, you can have more of like a older, chunkier concrete um, mix um, that could be super sloppy applied. It can bleed up and over the tiles if the tiles are pushed in messily by the person that made it, then it went too deep and the grout comes over it and details like that. Um, there's a quick video showing the difference between uh, grout or no grout. Um, and there's just little pits. I just like the little bit of like uh, pitting on the surface of the, of the tiles. Um, and then pebbles. Uh, we love in ZBrush to sculpt little pebbles and you break a crack and then you put tiny little pebbles in those little cracks to show like where that residue went when, it, when that chunk broke off and it broke down in smaller bits. So this kind of um, procedurally uh, creates that appearance uh, using a tile sampler. Um, and then it, they mask into the cracks um, to kind of settle in there. And some of them scatter randomly over on top of the tiles if you want to. Um, but a shout out to Josh Lynch um, for his awesome tutorial on uh, Substance Rocks. Uh, he has it on Gumroad and it's free and it's awesome. And he's super talented and he was uh, happy and grateful enough to allow me to mention him in the, uh, the talk tonight. Um, yeah, so that's the, the basis of that. And then I just wanted to put together a quick uh, video showing in action a little bit more exciting than talking about techie nodes um, to show what the node could do in a fast forward kind of um, video um, and to show how you can input any black and white image you want into it and then it'll create a video. Um, and at the end, there's a special treat from Richard Lyons, uh, one of our concept artists, uh, provided us with some, some fun black and white art.
Thank you. So, yeah, that wraps it up. Thank you guys very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. That was so awesome. Thank you so much. So we have a, we'll just have time for one or two questions. So first one here. Um, are y'all using, so you guys, are you, so you're using Substance. Um, how much, if at all, are any of the Substance live in engine? Or do y'all bake out the textures ahead of time um, from, once you've found a particular stone pattern or mud pattern or rock pattern that you like? And then the second part of the, or second half of my question is, how, how much time do you spend in the actual math uh, and out of the, I guess, the traditional graph network and behind to the actual math and the calculative mm -hmm. solutions in the back end, or do you just use the majority, spend the majority of your time in the traditional network? That's a good question. Um, so all of our textures are baked out uh, in, in the game. Um, they're all cooked out to usually a, a 1024. We'll work at a 2048 or 4096 um, within substance, but then they all get baked out at a 2048 and then plugged into the engine, and they're usually at a 1024. Um, but yeah, early on, we were investigating heavily into plugging substance directly through um, our material editing program called Surfer. Um, it was a big push in the beginning when Playgo was kind of a thing where you could just download a game and play it uh, automatically and these little substance files would pop in and they're just a couple bytes and then boom, they'd balloon into these amazing full res textures on the other side. Um, but it kind of became not so much uh, a priority for the project. Um, so we, we moved away from that um, and went old school. Um, possibly in the future, um, I, I, we're talking about doing some more hooks um, so you can even just drag your like assign your substance file to the material in Surfer um, and then have that um, uh, be able to update live from there instead of having to save out your, um, your textures. So challenge for you, Dave Smith, our uh, Surfer programmer. I'm not gonna hold you to it, um, but we've talked about it, we, we can dream. Um, as far as math uh, in substance, um, some people are more tech savvy than others. Um, I'm like script light. Um, I can do some little functiony things in there. Uh, I script some UI um, to expose parameters and very basic things like that. Um, uh, Brad and Rohelio are probably more of the people that will be able to dive in there and do effects maps and um, logic nodes and all kinds of crazy, wacky goodness. Um, personally, I do not. Uh, I stay more on the, the artsy node side of that. Thank you. Um, our last question is right here. Oh, uh, hey, I was actually wondering, a uh, question for Todd. Um, I was wondering if you guys supported Max by chance as like a pipeline. Uh, do you guys use Max in your pipeline or do you guys, are you guys solely using Maya? Uh, we don't have anything against Max. I mean, uh, if an artist has a need to use an application, they'll probably get access to it, but we've built our entire pipeline for pretty much every department through Maya, and there's years and years and years, decades of development into, <laughs> yeah, of, uh, into our tools, so it's native. Uh, Maya is at our core, basically, okay. across it's, multiple departments. It's, it's basically our editor. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yep. That's awesome. Let's have a big round of applause for all eight of our speakers tonight. So thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, it's been an amazing night. Thank you for joining us as well. It's raining pretty hard out there tonight, so when you do go, make sure you drive home safely. Um, we've been so lucky to see so much of that, um, and we can't wait to see what you come up with with The Lost Legacy. So good luck, guys, with that too. Um, so as I said earlier, this is our first event of 2017. 2017. We have many more on the way. February 2nd, we'll have Fox Animation Studios here. February 3rd, we'll bring back Epic Games for some Unreal Engine 4 goodness. Uh, February 9th, the Foundry is here for a Modo Live event, which is very exciting. And on the 16th, we have 3D concept designer Gomuk Bassin, um, and he'll be joining us here. Um, so lots coming up. Please stay tuned at nomon.edu forward slash events or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. 
um, or you can sign up to the mailing list at nomon.edu forward slash enews. Um, if anyone's interested in touring the campus tonight, it's a bit damp, but <laughs> we're still happy to show you around. Please let us know. Um,